Good. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. Good. Thanks for answering. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run through these slides this evening. Um, some housekeeping things before we get started. Um, first of all, next week is test number two, so we're not going to have class next week. Um, I'm going to review this section's uh, information, um, what I believe will be testable information at the end of the slide deck here whenever I get to cultural observations. Those bullets should be things that you should be paying attention to for the test. Um, in addition, you should be paying attention to the notes that I've posted on uh, Blackboard in the, I'm sorry, in Schoology, other school, um, in Blackboard, sorry, Schoology, dang it, um, in the updates. So I've been trying to summarize lecture notes in the updates, and um, those lecture notes have some you know, good information for what is testable material. So if anybody has any questions on that, let me know. Um, let me just do a quick check into the waiting room and make sure nobody else is there. Nope. Okay, great. Um, then we're going to go ahead and um, push off and talk about the total quality management movement. So uh, a lot of video that you guys had to watch this past week. Hopefully it was uh, edifying to understand uh, this guy, W. Edwards Deming, and the uh, impact that he's had on the current management movement that we're in that I believe that we're in right now, the total quality management movement. So I would say that this management movement started uh, post-World War II when Deming went over to post-war Japan as part of our uh, government's reconstruction effort um, with the government of Japan and began to uh, teach Japanese engineers and Japanese quality managers and leaders a method that he then summarized into 14 points. And um, Deming was heavily influenced by the human relations movement, but at the same time, he realized what we realized last week, and that is that if, the, if you focus entirely on the human side of the equation, then the operational uh, part of the balance gets destabilized and out of control. So we've tipped the scale, human relations has tipped the scale on the human system, and by focusing on people, we end up making poor quality. And so the total quality management movement becomes a response to the human relations movement. And the thing about this is that it really centers on this one guy, um, W. Edward Stemming. So let's get a cool, cool picture of him up there. Um, in this supplement, what I'm gonna do is go over what I think are the vital elements of total quality that appear in the operational excellence model. Um, especially these three things, improving quality to improve everything else, uh, improving leadership, not management. And we'll talk about the difference between the two of those tonight. And then improving people or um, doing making human development. So those are the three things that I'm going to cover in this supplement. Um, not, there are a couple of things that are repeated uh, from the videos, but um, really what I'm trying to do is hone in on a couple of key pieces of information here so that you can uh, get focused on what the total quality management movement was all about. All right, so uh, first up, improving quality to improve everything else. So the, the key point here is that it's the total quality, whoop, total quality management movement. Let me see if I can get a pencil up here. Uh, we'll go with green. Um, so it's the total quality management movement. And the reason I'm focusing in on that is because that's literally what drives all of Deming's, Deming's thinking, all of the 14 points, all of the seven cardinal sins, all have to do with specifically the, um, the production of quality. And um, so that's why it's called the total quality management movement. So let's talk about quality for a moment. Hold on a second, I think I got somebody in the waiting room. Yep. Okay. So let's talk about quality for a minute. Um, most of us understand quality just by virtue of the experiences that we have had. Um, we know it oftentimes, be, oftentimes because we experience the opposite of quality, that is a defect. And that's what should have happened didn't happen or what should not have happened did happen. So um, I cannot see you guys right now, but I'm gonna just trust that uh, you guys will weigh on, in on this. Uh, give me two or three examples 
um, one or two or three of you guys just give me a couple of examples when you've experienced a defect or poor quality in something that you've done. It's a restaurant. It's a, something that happened on the college in the at the college. Something that happened out there in the wor real world. Um, give me a couple of examples here. And you're just going to have to jump in and weigh in because I cannot see your uh, I can't see the screen right now. Anybody? Um, something that happened to me today, right before class, that's like really small and simple was like I got dinner from McDonald's. Um, and I was supposed to get like a certain sauce with my nuggets. And they screwed it up and gave me something else. So they gave yep. me like ranch. Um, something really, really small. And, simple. <laughs> and uh, okay, so what did you do anything about it or did you just say forget about it? I, the, the problem was I was ordering for myself and then picking up somebody else's online order. Um, and I was already holding up the drive through and I should have said something, but I did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's good. That that's, uh, we're going to get to this when we get to this next point, uh, defining the defect in the customer, but let's, so let's, uh, let's get a couple more examples. Anybody else? Poor quality or a defect? The service at the shack. Oh man. Ouch. Okay, can you be very specific? We cancel orders all the time and really okay. Rough it's rough. Okay, all right. So uh, service at the shack, we've got um, and, and so the defect there. What should have happened is that you should have gotten your order, but instead they canceled it. So that's the defect. Am I right? Yes, sir. All right, cool. How about one more? I can play this game all night. <laughs> Anybody? Nobody. Okay, I see you guys can play this game too. All right, so again, we won't belabor the point, but the opposite of quality is a defect, and a defect could be defined as <clears throat> what should have happened but didn't, or what should not have happened and did. Um, in operational excellence, that is my definition of a problem. So when we get to the point where we're starting to talk about, hold on a second, let me put this thing over so you guys can see it. Um, when we start to talk about improvement management and um, we'll, we will be talking about basic problem solving, we need a definition for a problem, a standard definition for a problem, and that's it right there, one of those two statements. That's when we recognize that we have a problem. Um, all right, so let's get to this next point here, defining the defect. Definition of the defect comes from the customer. And the reason I have customer uh, in all caps right there is because this word uh, from a language perspective, um, actually, you know, if you go way back, it it's, uh, comes from the word costumer. Um, so somebody who would build a, a set of clothing for somebody, you know, this is like a once or twice a year sort of thing. If you actually ordered your clothing, we're talking back in, in the 17th, 18th century when this word began to become um, popular in usage, we've converted that word to customer. And uh, one way to think of that is that we are the ones that we, the, the customer is the one who customizes what they want. So, you know, if you want ranch and, or you want, you know, honey mustard and you get ranch, you customized it, you define, you defined it, you define what quality is. And so therefore, when we know what quality is, when we know what we want, we can tell or detect whenever we have a defect or when we receive a defect. So, um, and, and one of the things that we do is we assign value to quality. So the definition of quality, or I'm sorry, the definition of value would be quality over cost. The quality over the cost. So the input is cost and, and then the quality is what we get out of it. And we all have sort of a mental model for that. That's why I was asking about the McDonald's, did you stop and did you go back and, you know, lodge a complaint or have them fix the defect? Um, a lot of our response to defects comes from the amount of value that we place on the, on the component of the order. And remember, we're talking about ordering things like materials and goods, services, and sometimes we order information. And those are the things that processes produce. And so any of those things can give us a defect can produce a defect, but the person who defines what a defect is, is the customer. And when we get into this next point here, everyone is a customer. It's helpful for us to think about um, producing something and handing off to the next person downstream. Um, can somebody just let me know whether or not this whiteboard is on the screen again, because I can't see myself. Can you guys see this whiteboard? 
Anybody? Yeah, you're good. Okay, thank you. So, you know, this, this would be the steps in a process that are linked. And one way to think about steps in a process that are linked is what direction are we flowing? So this would be the direction of the process or the flow of the process. And this would be upstream. I'm sorry, downstream. And this would be upstream here. So we can think of ourselves if we're X in the, in the next process step downstream from us, or the next process step that we hand off to in this overlap portion here is Y, we can be thinking of Y as our customer because we're producing, X is producing something and handing it off to the next uh, process step downstream. And uh, remember, we can produce a good, a service or an information. And so one of the things that Deming said is that um, in order to improve quality, to improve everything else, we need to think of everybody in the process as a customer. And it's easy to kind of get your head around the idea that Y is X's customer and Z is Y's customer, but it's a little harder to think of, first of all, what's the letter before X? QR. Let's call it T U V W X Y Z. Thank you. It, it's a little harder for X to be thinking of W as a customer. In what way would W be a customer of X's? In what way would the downstream process be a customer, I'm sorry, the upstream step in a process be the customer of the downstream step? What do you guys think? Um, like an example that I'm thinking of would be like, if you are like a manufacturer that procures products, you have to purchase the raw materials. And so you are a customer of the raw materials and then the raw materials to procurement to the next customer. Yeah, so that's a classic one. So let's just draw this. Let's let's pretend that W is our uh, raw material supplier, okay? And X orders the raw materials. So isn't X providing information to W in order for W to produce for X? So in that case, X is producing information and therefore W is X's customer. So our raw material suppliers our customers. The other thing that happens in uh, process flow like this is that sometimes the downstream process signals the upstream process to produce. In fact, that's what we want to happen in a lean process. We, we want, um, it's actually the idea of Kanban. I know you guys think of Kanban as material re replenishment, but Kanban also, there's uh, production Kanban as well. And that's the signal for the upstream process to produce. So when Y runs out of stuff to produce stuff for Z, they signal X to produce what they need in order for them to make what they need, what Y needs to make for Z. And so in that way, that signal becomes a piece of information as well. So if there's a bad signal, if there's an absence of a signal, that's a defect in a process when we're thinking of everybody Everybody around us is a customer whenever we're focusing on quality because that's where defects happen. Um, and this next bullet point says 94% of defects are attributable to management. Um, about half of those come from process design. The others come from, from management process defects that are made. So let's talk real quickly about the difference between leadership and management. So over here, we've got um, leadership versus management. And Deming said that we've got to improve leadership. Um, and he distinguished between, he made a distinction between leadership and management. This was also something that was becoming popular to do in the human relations movement, because remember what was, what was one of the overriding things, you know, big word in the human relations uh, movement that, um, that we had to pay attention to in terms of management it starts with an M. What did, what did we pay attention to in human relations? We were worried about this. It starts with an M. Motivation. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, we're worried about motivation. And motivation is one of the byproducts of influence. And influence is what leadership, what the leadership process does. So leadership, definition of leadership is influencing a group of people to attain a common goal. And so the operational word there is influencing um, versus management. Uh, and, and I'm just going to quote Simon Sinek here. Okay. So Sinek, uh, he, who's a contemporary writer, I think I spoke about him last week. Um, 
Cynic says that um, management is manipulating others for personal gain and leadership is the responsibility to help others rise up to the occasion. In another, um, in another case, Cynic said that leaders do, I'm sorry, managers do the right things. So we need management, but uh, leaders do things right. So it's the quality side of, of um, doing those things. So making sure that we're picking up the right problem to solve is a leadership uh, question. Um, and uh, how we solve that problem is a leadership question. So there is a difference between leadership and management. And then uh, Deming himself said that leadership must help people. And so when you begin to start to look at leadership versus management, especially in this, um, in these two to three decades, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, heavily influenced, leadership thinking is heavily influenced by um, the human relations movement as this movement is beginning to take off. And what you get is uh, something called servant leadership. So I, I listed Winston here because this is a current paper on uh, servant leadership theory, but servant leadership theory actually comes to us from a guy named Greenleaf and uh, popular in the beginning of the 1970s. And um, it was an interesting theory of leadership. Uh, many people think that Greenleaf was inspired by um, religious leadership and he wasn't. He actually read a novel and the novel was about a Sherpa in the Himalayas. And um, so the, the novel, uh, you know, uh, tells the story about what's going on between the Sherpa and the people that uh, he's guiding up to the top of this mountain. And uh, at the end of the story, it's revealed that the Sherpa is actually the leader of the group. So um, this was a group that decided they were going to climb a mountain. And uh, all along, what you're seeing is what you think you're seeing here is a Sherpa who's really basically carrying the weight for everybody and helping people and guiding people and telling them where to step. And uh, what it turns out is, you know, this would be the equivalent of a modern day CEO for that organization. So big surprise ending. And this really impacts this guy Greenleaf. So Greenleaf says, wait a minute, you know, there are some principles that seem to be true. Um, I put theory up here because uh, this thing has been tested and researched. But when Greenleaf you know, proposed this, it was less of a theory and more of a philosophy of, of leadership. So I wanted to give you a summary here of what Winston said in 2015. The purpose of Winston's paper was, or their study, was to come up with, you know, you can see eight or 10 basic things that are ascribed to servant leadership theory. Uh, because there were ma there's many, many versions of servant leadership. You can't really find a good single definition of servant leadership. Um, even people that reference back to Greenleaf, Greenleaf didn't really give you a very succinct, uh, researchable, um, measurable, empirical definition of servant leadership. Um, and so, so this study came along in 2015. Winston did this and, and uh, some colleagues. Um, yeah, Winston and Fields. Um, but they came up with these characteristics of servant leadership. I just want to share these with you, get, see what you think here. So practice what you preach. Serve people unconditionally. So that means I'm going to serve people regardless of whether I like them or not, whether they are like me or not, or whether they like me. So whether I like them, whether I'm like them, or whether they like me. So it's unconditional service to people. Uh, serving is my mission and my responsibility. I'm genuinely interested in my followers and, and uh, really interested in their well-being. Genuinely in interested in my followers. Uh, willing to sacrifice for others. Always honest. Seek trust, not fear. Um, has a high sense, or I'm sorry, has a sense of higher calling. Um, and, and that is kind of not, not pinned down. So you could have... Uh, People who are in Eastern religions, for example, have a sense of higher calling and do all of these things. And uh, last one is promotes values that transcend self-interest and material success here. So one of the cri criticisms of servant leadership theory is that it's all focused on trying to help people. And uh, one of the criticisms is that it doesn't necessarily fit well in uh, say a for-profit setting or a high performance setting 
because it's so focused on people and there's nothing in here that says attain the mission or, you know, be very effective and, uh, or uh, get me high performance. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of a uh, counterintuitiveness to servant leadership theory. In fact, a guy named Jennings, uh, who's from Pittsburgh, um, actually uh, led something called the Pittsburgh Leadership Council in 2016, published a book called Serving Leadership. And what he tried to do, he and his colleagues tried to do, was to mix transformational leadership, which is very much focused on uh, attaining the mission goals and performance with value underpinning and with uh, a bit of human um, focus on human development as an underpinning. And so Jennings takes both of these models and, and mixes them. And um, what he tries to do is contextualize service so that it's uh, service in the context of mission and people development simultaneously. Um, so I, I've got mixed reviews on, on both of these. I think that it's a legitimate critique if you go back to the basic servant uh, leadership theory, but um, any kind of a leader uh, is dropped into an organization. If it's a positional leadership role, they're dropped into an organization. And from a management perspective, they're given a set of goals that they've got to attain. They've got performance they've got to meet. And uh, so if you adopt the servant leadership theory to do that. And remember, I don't wanna get lost in this, that Deming said leadership must help people. Um, then Deming was a, a proponent of servant leadership. He didn't come out and say that, but what he, when you read what he says, it's very consistent with servant leadership theory. Uh, so I think that servant leadership is applicable in an organization where mission attainment is important. I don't know that you actually have to go the extra mile to mix transformational leadership as a model or a theory with it in order to get um, servant leadership to work in a for-profit or in an organization where you need high performance. Um, in fact, some of the research that I've done on human, or I'm sorry, high reliability organizations, these would be things like um, uh, SEAL teams, special forces, um, professional fire departments, professional de police departments, SWAT teams, um, uh, the folks that work on the deck of an offshore oil rig, these are all, they're called high reliability organizations. And their whole purpose is to perform at a very high level reliably. So continuously, constantly. And, and what happens there is that leadership gets distributed among the team and the overall leader takes on this servant leadership role. So I'm gonna say that they're not um, dissonant. They're, they're actually, they actually go together and I'm gonna say that if we're going to say this is the right leadership model for um, the total quality management movement, it's servant leadership is the model that I would go for. All right, so uh, the other thing that we talked about is that if the leader's job is to take care of people, the leader's job is to improve people or to do human development. And uh, in one of the videos uh, where Deming is being interviewed with Robert Reich, who you may have recognized, a very young Robert Reich, uh, as the uh, Secretary of Treasury probably 10 years ago or 15 years ago, um, but an, an economist from Harvard, uh, he, Deming talks about these two points, point 13 and point six. These both come from the 14 points that, uh, that Deming proposes. The first one is self-improvement and he distinguishes between the sixth point, training and retraining. So in, in point 13, he says, you've got to educate members of the group, but the key here is you educate them to whatever they fancy. These are his words. Whatever they fancy learning about, you, you let them pursue that in terms of education. In fact, you support them trying to pursue that education. And you can let your mind wander with what that would look like from a management standpoint. It might be providing time. It might be providing resources like tuition reimbursement or tuition um, support. You know, we'll pay half of your tuition if you go out and get some sort of a, a different degree or something like that. Um, but his point is that that's a little bit different than job and task training and retraining. That's for the organization's performance and that's for quality. Um, this is for elevating the mind and thinking to produce quality. So that's the difference between these two. But this is an important part because this, again, this looks like and smells like and feels like human relations, right? But you know, when we're over here talking about quality, improving quality to improve everything else, that really feels like 
something that's operational, right? We don't want to produce a defect um, because a defect can cost us money or uh, a defect, if we have to rework it, um, costs us time. And so therefore that's a loss of productivity. But remember he said, improve quality to improve everything else. So we want to not focus on productivity and get good quality, not focus on profitability and get good quality. We want to focus on quality and forget about all that other stuff and realize that philosophically that if we focus on quality, the rest of that stuff will come. In fact, in that very same video uh, where he's with uh, Dr. Reich, he, he mentions the fact that um, don't focus on cost because if you focus on quality, cost will come. You, you just spend less money and you're more productive if you focus on quality and produce less defects. All right, this is going quick. Um, let me stop there and uh, before we get to this next slide. Hey, now I can see everybody. All right, um, one second here. Okay, uh, thanks Nick for letting me know about Teddy, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, any questions or comments about this style of leadership or management? Have you encountered servant leadership or have you encountered some you know, super focus on quality out there where you've worked or where you've lived or you know, even in your family, in other orga social organizations, sports teams? Talk to me about that. Anybody have any examples? I, I actually have a comment. Um, it's about something a little bit different. Sure thing, Ed. Uh, so it was uh, one thing from the videos. It was a stat that I wrote down because I thought it was kind of interesting and it seems to kind of contradict a little bit what we were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the when it comes down to the root of problems that 6% of it is uh, at fault of the employee and 94% of it is at fault um, of management. Yeah. And you know, under the whole quality control movement, I mean, obviously it's leadership based, but um, also it seems to place an emphasis on just, you know, believing in your employees and their capabilities. So it seems like there's kind of a gap in who's accountable for what, whether it's like the management versus the employee on like when a lack of quality arises. Yeah, I'm writing down the word accountability. Um your classmates are going to say, oh, man, I wish you wouldn't have brought that up because uh, I'm, I'm currently doing some research on accountability. It's, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big uh, top of mind thing for executive teams right now. So I'll, I'll circle back to that uh, towards the end of the lecture. But let me just, I'm going to reinforce what Deming said. So 94% of the, the problems that we have are attributable to management or to the process. And because they're attributable to to the process, not the, to the person operating the process. Management's responsible for designing the process. So therefore, pretty much everything is attributable to management here. And by management, we're not talking about management versus leadership. We're talking about those who supervise and those who are in charge of, of uh, producing, making good services and, and producing information. Um, I'm gonna say, yeah, absolutely, 100%. That is definitely the case. Now, human nature though, is that we want to, uh, we want to do Herzberg theory X theory Y. We want to, as leaders and managers, um, when you guys hit the ground running there, or if you're currently a manager of something, um, you've probably gone through this mental exercise where you've divided the work group up into people that are theory Y and people who are theory X, you know? So there are people who are lazy, theory X, lazy. I got to control them. I got to direct them. Um, they're going to make mistakes. And so I've got to look over their shoulders and control them all the time, as opposed to theory Y. People are basically good. They want to make good things. They want to produce quality. And uh, I can just give them support, not direction. And um, that, that's what we do. I mean, early uh, in, in our management careers, if we're not equipped to uh, think a little bit more in a more sophisticated way, that's what we do. We just divide people into those groups. So, um, I'll just tell you a quick story. Uh, so I was doing a, a consulting gig with a manufacturer that makes large compressors, um, the same as they make down at uh, Elliott Corporation in Jeanette. Uh, but this was Elliott's open shop that then was purchased. So a non-union shop that was purchased by another um, company in Asia and uh, they have an operation in Delmont. 
And um, so this is one of our clients uh, when, when I was working at KCOE and we, we set the management system up there, the problem solving system up on the shop floor. And uh, it, it was all in the hands of the managers. So there were shop floor managers, you know, they had anywhere from eight to 10 employees apiece. There was a machine shop, there was an assembly shop, there was a maintenance shop, and then there was a testing shop. And uh, when I would go there, I would park in the parking lot and I would walk the process backwards. I go to the shipping dock, back to testing, um, and just kind of walk the process the whole way back to the machine shop. And I would check the artifacts that they had created. So um, we use these little um, eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper that are divided into four quadrants for problem solving. So identify the problem, find the root cause of the problem, identify counter, design countermeasures to remove the root cause, and then check and control. So visually check and control to see whether the root cause is gone. So there are these eight and a half by 11 problem solving sheets hanging up all over um, on these problem solving boards for each team area. The, probably the third or fourth time that I was down there, I was walking backwards you know, along the process and I got to the testing shop and um, on, in, in the root cause, I found a problem solving sheet that said this. And so I pulled it down and, you know, I, so, I, and I took it and I used it as an example. Um, I didn't know at the time, you know, I, I couldn't pinpoint it theory X, theory Y. I couldn't say, you know, this was Deming, this is anti-Deming or whatever. Um, but, you know, I just knew it was wrong. I just knew it was, it was disparaging to Bob, whoever Bob was. <laughs> um, and I'm sure Bob didn't want to work there much anymore. Uh, but that was a style and, and the team leader had done this. So this was, you know, the team leader had signed off on this saying, yeah, this is a good problem solving sheet here. Um, so said in a different way, in an operational excellence way, a person is never the root cause of a problem ever. Okay, Ed. Um, yes, there are some people who are negatively deviant. And, and I like to say, like most people don't wake up in the morning and think I'm going to go to work and do something really crappy. I'm going to make a defect, you know, or I'm going to piss off my, my supervisor. They don't, they don't wake up in the morning and do that. In fact, most people wake up in the morning and they want to go have a good day at work because they want to come home and not have to worry about work. Right. So, so that one way to do that is to focus on management as being responsible for the process and realizing that the process is what gives you the problem. The other thing that we can do as leaders is focus on helping the people that are working for us. So um, asking them what's confusing about this process. So the reason that uh, I forgot, I, I couldn't see who got the, uh, the wrong dipping sauce tonight. Who got the wrong dipping sauce tonight? Mute off and let me know. That was me, Alex. Oh, okay, Alex, thanks. So when Alex got the wrong dipping sauce, it wasn't because, you know, uh, Bob, who now doesn't work at, uh, at the compressor place, works at McDonald's. It's not because Bob's an idiot, but, but that's literally what, what we're thinking is why can't these people get this order right? You know, um, so a whole lot of our human nature is tilted in that operational direction away from, from humans. And uh, even though we want to be treated differently, we generally, um, think the worst of people. So uh, it, it is not a surprise that 94% come from the management side of things. I know I circled around to Ed, but I, I hopefully cleared that up. This is a, this is a uh, piece of Deming that's going to reappear in operational excellence, and it's a pretty important piece here. So uh, in other words, when I took this to the, uh, to the general manager, I said, look, you know, a person is never the root cause of a problem. It just doesn't work that way. Um, if this process has given us a problem, it's because we designed it. In fact, Deming and Schuhart, who's the other father of the uh, quality mo movement, um, Schuhart was famous for saying that every process gives you exactly what it was designed to give you. So if it's making defects, it's because the process was designed to get you defects. Um, in high reliability organizations, what we try to do is create um, what's called the Swiss cheese effect. So we know that humans make errors. You know, they're about every uh, seven times out of 1,000 attempts, every seventh, seven times in 1,000, a human will make an error. And so we should build processes that understand that that's going to happen and put some kind of a Swiss cheese model in there to make sure that that defect doesn't get the whole, pass the whole way downstream. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, that's good. All right. Um, that was a really good question. Other questions or has anybody experienced servant leadership?
Nobody? No? Okay. You're asking about servant leadership, right? Yes, sir, Alex. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the closest I could think to that would probably be um, my boss from like the first the job that I worked in high school through most of the time in college um, in terms of just like making sure that we as employees had pretty much everything we could from my boss and then, you know, in terms of his interaction with customers, I, I would think, and, and I could be off, you know, it was more or less he was willing to do kind of whatever he needed to. So we, it was a, uh, a nursery and if he didn't, you know, we had set prices, not necessarily a place to bargain. Um, but if people were, for some reason decided that they were special and wanted a discount, my boss would often work with them because he'd rather have the sale than have to deal with someone, um, you know, giving them two or three dollars essentially, maybe off a ten percent, or maybe even significantly more than that, uh, depending on how much the item costs. That's a great example. Um, anybody else have one? I have a quick one. If any, anybody else have one? I do. Yeah, go ahead, Maeve. Uh, when I graduated high school, for a couple months, I went and worked for a nonprofit, kind of mm -hmm. like Habitat, but not not directly affiliated with Habitat, mm -hmm. um, just in like the Pittsburgh area. And the goal for, I mean, from foreman to like board of directors down to like me, who I was just like late general laborer, mm -hmm. um, it was, I mean, the goal was just all helping people that needed help and doing home repairs, building houses, framing, all that kind of stuff. So everything we did was really centered around that. All of the money decisions were centered around that. It was never really about um, creating like a super dominant organization that took over the area, but more about helping the area that we were in. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's a really good example. Um, so now I've got two examples in, in, in a principle. So the principle that Maeve is talking about is um, often nonprofits that are directed at service will attract servant leaders because it, it, it's just a super fit, right? Um, um, but the cool thing was that the CEO of the Westmoreland Food Bank was right in there in the mix of the whole thing. And, um, and in fact, two of the guys mentioned, um, you know, their admiration for the CEO. She was right in the middle of things and, and they said, man, that's our CEO over there. And she's sweating and, and just doing the hard work and rolling up her sleeves to get some stuff done. That's evidence of a, a servant leader. Um, my personal story is I used to work at Camp David for President Reagan and President Bush, the first President Bush. And the commanding officer at Camp David is a pretty big deal. So there's a Navy commander um, you know, they are the person that essentially works with the president and with the president's family to make sure everything goes well. Um, you could keep a distance from your troops if you were the commanding officer of Camp David. Um, at one point, we were working on a broken sewer line. So I was in the CBs. I did construction in the Navy. And we were working on a broken sewer line. And, uh, you know, it didn't matter. I was an officer. You know, I had enlisted guys with me. Uh, we were going to be out there all night if we didn't, everybody didn't pitch in. So uh, another crew from another department came down, a bunch of officers came down and we're all just working there together. And our skipper comes down over the hill in the golf cart um, and he's in dress blues and he's, he's looking at us and he gets a report from me and, um, and I, you know, cheery eye eye, see you later, sir. Have a good night. Um, about five minutes later, he shows back up in jeans and a t-shirt and then jumps down in the ditch with us, you know, shoveling, you know what, shoveling sewage to try and get this pipe fixed. Um, the, the value of doing that for my sailors, for the troops that work for me was huge. Um, so first of all, it inspired me to be like him. Um, but the other thing is, here's a guy that exercises servant leadership and his power of influence comes from the fact that he's willing to get down there and get dirty, roll his sleeves up and work right alongside of the people that he's leading. Um, this was a high stakes organization. You know, Camp David is not a thing that you fool around with. It, it's a uh, high security operation as well. And so uh, for him to do that is kind of evidence to me that there's some value in this type of leadership. All right, um, I'm gonna share this one last slide with you guys. We're gonna go over this um, slowly so that we can make sure that we're all leveled up for our test next week. So the, some cultural observations. 
Um, and as I said before, expect that you would see these kinds of things on the test in some way, shape, or form. So uh, I didn't have time to draw a values triangle, but um, let me see if I can do that real quick. <clears throat> so yeah, if this was our values, our cultural triangle, this is really hard. I've never done this before with my finger. All right, bear with me. There we go, all right. Um, so if this is our uh, cultural triangle up here, total quality management behavior is to not make defects. Now, after I wrote that down, I thought to myself, well, you know, you could, you could be in an organization that demands no defects and your boss could be like a terror, like the, you know, the, they, they might like uh, shame you into not making any defects and um, you know, but you're not going to enjoy working there. Um, the difference is that when we come down to the mindsets, quality is good for us. So not making defects means that we make quality. The mindset is that quality is good for us and it's good for us both as a process and for the people. So let me just dwell here for a moment. Evidence shows that when you're in a job where you are creating value, not that, you know, not sort of the intrinsic idea of creating value, like, um, like you know, working in, in a habitat organization, building houses or filling boxes of food for people, um, that's valuable to those people. But making value means that we're making high quality. So evidence shows that when you are in a job where you're able to make high quality, you, A, your performance is better, and B, your attitude is better. So you actually are engaged with your work, you want to come to work, and your, uh, your effectiveness, your performance is better when you're in a, an environment where people are trying to make quality. And so that, again, is a little bit counterintuitive. And that's why I say here, quality is good for us as people. It's good for us to be making quality products, services, and information because it just feels right. Um, then it's obviously good for the process because if we don't make, um, if we make good quality, that means we're not making defects. So our productivity is going to be high, our costs are going to be lower, and so for the processes uh, benefit, it's good for us to make quality as well. And then the other mindset that appears here in the uh, cultural triangle is this idea of customer first. Whoops, didn't mean to click it. Is this idea of customer first. So, um, you know, we're, we're back here in our process diagram, uh, the idea that uh, X, Y, and Z are linked together in the process and X is Y's customer as well as Z. So the upstream and the downstream processes are customers of ours. Um, X because Y is giving or supplying information to X and Z because I'm creating a good service or a piece of information for Z and trying to hand that off. Um, this, this whole um, idea of being able to, to understand the process steps that are in play, who's doing what and what the inputs and the outputs of each of these process steps is a very valuable um, management competency. Remember, management is doing um, the right things, doing things right, I'm sorry. Um, and so that's a really valuable competency for you to have. It's something that I've picked up as an operational excellence consultant because I'm constantly coaching people to basic problem solving. In order to do basic problem solving, if, a, if, a, if I recognize a problem down here, if I find a defect down here, I know that it's probably been caused upstream someplace. So I'm, I've got to be able to navigate the process. This is really easy to do in manufacturing because typically you can just walk upstream in an assembly line. But when you get into processes that are information laden or uh, virtual processes where a lot of the process steps are hidden um, in a virtual world, then it's a, it's a lot harder to do unless you have some grasp for this happens and then this happens and then this happens. And the same thing in healthcare. Um, so there are industries and industry sectors that are not real good at uh, with um, being uh, process literate is what I call it, process literacy, where I'm able to see what's happening and see that this is a sequence of tasks that are connected and that um, there are inputs and outputs and handoffs. So um, customer first is an important mindset here. And then under values, 
three things that, that come to top of mind when I think of total quality management. One is leadership. So this is really the first time that a management movement as big as human relations and as big as scientific management said leadership, not management, is extremely important and that leadership is about helping people. Um, improvement. This is where we get the idea that improvement, continual improvement, if you uh, looked at the videos, um, the, so many of the 14 points had to do with this idea of improvement, innovation, and continual improvement. Um, remember, that's where we've got, uh, Deming is where we get the plan, do, check, act cycle. Um, and so uh, the other, the other um, management systems, management uh, movements don't emphasize improvement. They emphasize if scientific management, one best way, if you can't do it, you're out. Okay, so there is no improvement. There's one best way. Uh, and then in human relations, we're only concerned about self-improvement. We're not, we're not concerned about uh, a holistic operational and human view of improvement. So total quality introduces improvement. And then the last thing here is learning. So um, this is absolutely uh, an extension from the human relations movement that links it back to human relations. Um, total quality management is concerned with human development. Uh, but in, in those two ways that we talked about, one was um, just principle number six, which is training and retraining. So learning the job, learning the task of the job so I don't make a defect. And then pr uh, point number 13, um, which is education and self-development. And remember, that's anything that you can conceive of just to try to get your mind working and thinking creatively. So uh, we're here in the human and operations balance now. And what we saw was that... Uh, the scientific management movement tips the scale in the operational direction, and then the human relations movement comes along and tips it in the human direction. And so what we need is a force over here on the operational side that doesn't go too far, and that force is quality. So what we're going to do is go to the process, we're going to go to the operational side, we're going to standardize it, and as we're doing that, the thing that stops it from going too far are the human points. Seven of the human points have to do with operations and seven of the human points have to do with um, the human system. And so those human points, things like human development, self-development, training and retraining, those are the things that, that are weights that are added to this side. So as quality pushes down, this doesn't get out of balance here. And then suddenly what you've got is a is a balance between the human and the operational systems. And why is that a big deal? Because that's what we're aiming for. That's what operational excellence is aiming for. And that comes to us from Deming, the father of total quality management. Um, one last point here. I mentioned Deming's the father of TQM. One last point focuses on quality, not profitability and not on productivity. I mentioned that before. They happen to improve, but only secondarily. That's a typo right there. I'll fix it before we get done here tonight, but it's only secondarily. Um, if you focus on profitability or productivity alone, they will tip the balance. And I, you know, another thing that we could put in there is if you focus too much on the human system, the, the balance will also tip and, and quality will get out of control. So um, that's pretty much it. A couple of references here for you. I uh, don't expect you to know anything about those, just trying to respect some of the authors that have contributed to this. So Jennings, The Serving Leader, it's an interesting book if you've got, I don't know, if you're interested in leadership, if you're interested in um, developing your own brand of leadership, um, this is a really great place to start. And then this is an article, again, it's pretty, it's a study. So there was a lot of, uh, it's a quantitative study on uh, how to measure servant leadership. Uh, but in order to do that, they came up with those eight or 10 characteristics or competencies for servant leadership. There's my man Deming. Um, that's what we're going to close with. So let me stop the share here and see if anybody's got any questions. Any last questions before the test next week? Uh, this could be on any of the movements that you wanna. So the three movements we're talking about is scientific management, human relations management, and total quality management. Those are the three movements that we're gonna be looking at um, in the test. Any questions on those? Are we looking at a similar format? Yeah, thanks, Devin. Absolutely gonna be very similar. So true and false, multiple guess or multiple choice. Um, yeah, I haven't figured out a good way to uh, do 
uh, the testing in this environment yet. So I'll take any and all sort of feedback that you guys uh, want to give me for that. I know some people did struggle with the format with because, you know, it, uh, like I, I pay attention to words and so if, like a single word can throw me off on a multiple choice answer. Um, so there are some tech techniques and skills for that. I, based on your y'all's feedback from last time, I'm going to be try to be very careful with the wording here. So just stick to the notes, stick to those updates that I gave you on, um, on Schoology and uh, stick to the last slide here. And I think we're going to be okay. And if anybody's missing in action, so I know Teddy wasn't able to get here. Um, if somebody could, uh, Nick, if, Nick Navarro, do you talk to Teddy on a regular basis? Nick, are you there? Well, I'll catch up with Nick later. Um, but if anybody knows Teddy, uh, let's try to get him that information as well, please. Okay. All right, as usual, I'll stick around for another uh, five, 10 minutes. If anybody has any specific questions uh, you wanna ask, uh, if not, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the meeting and I will see you guys. Remember, we're not meeting next week, so I'll see you not next week, but the week after um, when we pick up and start talking about operational excellence. Man, if you think I love this stuff, wait till we get to operational excellence. I can go all night. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, we'll see you guys. Have a good week. You too. See you. Um, are you going to post like um, kind of like the topics again, like you did for like the last test? Yeah. So who is that? Dominic? No, it's Tyler. Okay, Tyler. Yeah. So what we're going to do is, uh, no, I'm not going to post those. What, I've been doing that as we've gone along here. Um, so let me just share something here with you real quick. Just so I can show you exactly what I'm talking about here. Just bear with me for a second. I should just log into Schoology at the beginning of every class. I always have to put all my stuff in here. Yep, yep, yep. Schoology. Huh. Well. Yeah, okay. Not working right now. Tyler, do you have Schoology pulled up? My Schoology isn't working either. Oh, you, same too. Okay. So maybe it's something. Yeah, it keeps wanting to like me to authorize something and just download something. Yeah, All yeah, right. So Tyler, this is what to do though. It's fairly easy. Go to the updates for this course. So if you go to our course in Schoology, look on the left-hand side, there's a, like a tab or a, a label yeah. for updates. And if you click on that, you should get a list of updates. Some of them are you know, from a couple of weeks ago, there was that class that I wasn't able to get in on time and missed you guys. Um, but there, for the past two weeks, I've summarized my lecture. And the summary of those lecture uh, notes are what I'm going to build the test off of. Okay. okay. And then the only other, so I'm not going to do that for tonight. I'm just going to use this last slide, this slide that is entitled Cultural Observations. Okay, I got it. So you're, yeah, you're only using that slide you said tonight, the, the last one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. The rest of the stuff is kind of, uh, it's summarized on that last slide. So, okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Anybody else have questions? No? Okay, Jay. See ya.